Quantum Feedback Loop. I'm your host, James Myers, and I also publish The Quantum Record. I learned a great deal in this episode from our guest, neuroscientist Dr. Birchin Ikes. Birchin describes her new initiative called EcoNeuro, which will study the effects of climate change on the brain in different areas and circumstances around the globe. Birchin is a pioneer in investigating the effects on brain health from pollution, extreme heat, and other environmental stresses. After hearing Birchin describe the concerns of today's youth and the risk of reaching a point of no return with the health of our brains, you might share the same sense of urgency I felt for bringing the issues to the table, both locally and in global discussions on climate change. Welcome, Birch, and I'm looking forward to hearing about your new eco neuro venture to investigate the effects of climate change on the brain. So welcome to the Quantum Feedback Loop podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So to begin with, I understand your background is in neurobiology, and I wonder if you can tell us a bit about the science and what it says about the connection between the environment and our brains. Absolutely. Yeah, neurobiology is uh, the science to study the nervous system, which involves the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system. So the nerves that are around our neck and our bodies that receive and send signals to the brain and the spinal cord. And my focus area has been on neurodegenerative diseases such as um, Parkinson's and ALS and Alzheimer's disease. And uh, for many, many years, scientists who have been studying brain disorders, this could be any neurological or mental disorder, they have focused on studying the brain and trying to understand what happened to the brain, really focusing on the nerve cells in the brain, um, neurons. But what we have started to see more and more as the science had progressed is that um, just looking simply at the brain to try to understand what happens to the nerve cells or simply looking at the nerve cells don't give us the full picture. Our brain is connected to our body and just as our brain controls our body, our body affects and controls our brain. And we even have uh, nerve cells in our gut and there is the gut brain axis that sends signals from the uh, our gut to the brain. There have been studies more and more showing that, for example, in diseases like Parkinson's disease, we see uh, damages happening to the neurons in our gut happening way before we see any neurological symptoms. So we are, we are trying to understand now that when we're studying the brain to understand how it works, why it gets diseases, we really have to understand the whole picture, look at the whole picture, see what's happening in the body. And our body gets affected by the environment we live in, by the way we treat it, by the things we're exposed to. It could be digital chemical. We live in a digital chemical world as one of the um, neuroscientists I was talking to recently. So, and all those exposures affect our body, which then affects our brain. And I think the field is really coming into understanding that uh, we really have to look uh, around ourselves when we're really studying the brain and the spinal cord. Really interesting and, and so much still to be learned about the brain, I guess. And you mentioned the neurodegenerative diseases, and I'm wondering, has there been any connection made between rates of those and environmental change? Like, are they, are they increasing, for example, as a result of environmental change? Yes, Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that have been uh, studied more than others have been the um, exposure to air pollution. So now uh, there's a lot of studies happening around understanding how air po- exposure to air pollution, even at the stage of um, when the fetuses are in mother's womb and how it might affect them in later in life. And there have been studies that have shown air pollution as a risk factor for dementia. Now, dementia is... Um, and dementia and Alzheimer's diseases, which is one of the forms of dementia, affects more and more people every day. So far, I would say 55 million uh, people have uh, around the world have dementia, and they expect this number to triple by 2050. Um, so it is becoming a big problem, an epidemic on its own, uh, these neurodegenerative diseases. And we know that a certain pollutants, air pollution, um, can increase our, our risk for getting these disorders. Wow, that's quite shocking, actually, and to think about. So, and you're trying to do something about this with your eco neuro venture, and maybe you could just tell us a, a little bit about what it is, what it's doing, and uh, what your goals are for it. Uh, and I understand you have a network of scientists that you're building uh, for this venture as well. 
Yes, absolutely. So Econeuro um, is a research organization and a resource hub. Um, it, its main goal is to explore the intersection of climate change and brain health uh, to improve global health. And to so one of the principal goals we want to understand is how climate change affects our brain, our brain health. And this includes neurological health and mental health. And one of the, uh, and I see this as a three-tiered approach of trying to really understand. And one is improve our understanding, scientific understanding of this through more research, more scientific funding and awareness and studies around this field. Because when you when you look for a climate change in neuroscience, you actually see uh, close to no studies having done. There are studies that are done in environmental health, epidemiology, that kind of looks some certain aspects of climate change and neuroscience. But when you try to combine those and try to get a big overall picture of what's happening, there's really very little information and attention given to this topic. Uh, so one of the Econera's biggest goals is to really raise more awareness about this topic, uh, raise more interest around this topic, uh, both at a, as a research and a public uh, point of view, increase our understanding through research and collaborations with, uh, with other, um, with um, public health um, and neuroscience uh, experts around the world and then eventually to put it into action. So the first, first tier is to really in, increase our understanding, really try to understand what, to what aspects this could be happening. And one of the ways we're trying to do this is uh, that I'm trying to build right now is this net network of experts from different parts of the world. Um, I'm talking with um, experts right now in Turkey because Turkey is one of the countries, well, that's where I'm from, so I have connections, one thing, but. Uh, is one of the places that get most affected by drought and wildfires. Um, India, uh, because India is one of the places that is most affected through climate change in terms of extreme heat exposure and pollution, air pollution. New Delhi is one of the most polluted uh, cities in the world. Um, and the Philippines, which has the uh, biggest risks for uh, sea level rise uh, and also spread of vector-borne diseases and other aspects of climate change's impact on health. And what we're trying to do is in talking with these experts and trying to see what they're seeing in their communities, what kind of health problems they're dealing with in the context of neuroscience and brain health, is to try to not get a comparative but a cumulative understanding of how uh, climate change affects the brain health and, and how vast from neurodevelopment to neurodegenerative it could be impacting a human's lifetime, but also in different aspects, ways it can do it. This is our first tier. The second tier is to try to really um, spread the word, raise awareness, communicate what we know to, to um, other scientists and funders to gain interest in this area, to do more research, but also to the public and do, to our communities, and eventually to put this increased global understanding into local actions, to work with local communities, public health organizations, and so on, to, to make this uh, uh, knowledge, turn this knowledge into action and to, to bring about changes that will improve the health uh, of the communities. Well, that, that's really exciting. And the fact that you're doing it globally will give, I think, a global picture of, of these consequences. So it's not just you know, something that affects us locally. It, it is something worldwide. And, and as you said, you know, the different effects across the world. Um, given that this is a global problem, is there any discussion forming in forums like, you know, the COP summit that's coming up uh, or any other international discussions? Has has this been on the table anywhere yet? That's a great question. You know, the uh, Lancet had um, published a report last year about climate change and health, and they had uh, a lot of emphasis on the ways uh, climate change impacts health around cardiovascular diseases and how it affects respiratory system and so on. But there was only in that whole entire report, very little, maybe just like some minuscule um, sentence of details around uh, a word about mental health, a word about increased risk for dementia or, uh, or neurological symptoms, but no, uh, no sections around, no uh, discussion points around really how the brain overall 
is impacted and and we see that over and over in other uh, discussions around uh, when you look at climate change and health groups there's very there's no emphasis that brings together um or very little i shouldn't say any but very little discussions around the brain and climate change and that's one of that's why i think it's so important to be able to talking about it to as many people as we can to really bring um because what we don't know is while you can perhaps see this as vascular damage much faster if someone in an extreme heat having a heart attack, the damage we see on the brain can take years and years for us to observe. So it's really it's really hard to make a point be like, you know, we're just starting to see how our brains have been impacted by climate change. Let's let's talk in 10 years, you then this will become much more bigger problem but by that time it might by then it might be too late so it's really important that we start these discussions now so that we can really mitigate the damage that we will be seeing in in a decade from now uh, most likely and, and that points to i guess one of the major problems in terms of uh, measuring the effects of climate change on the brain that very long-term effect that it has um, are there other difficulties in measuring the, the effects of climate change on the brain? Yes, <laughs> I think it's, it's it's extremely difficult, both in a lab setting and in a community public health setting. Um, because for one thing, our brains are incredible organs. They are extremely um plastic um they um adaptive so when a change a damage happens it finds ways to uh, mitigate that damage by rewiring itself and using other parts of the brain that is not so damaged to adapt and continue functioning um which is an incredible really amazing role of our brain but then what happens is that it continues to mitigate that damage. It continues to hide that damage, hide that damage, hide that damage. So you don't see any neurological symptoms happening or uh, or, or mental symptoms happening um, for a while until it reaches to a point of what we call uh, no return, where the damage passes a certain threshold. And it's so severe at that point that uh, it's a point of no return. It's really um, impossible almost to reverse that damage and we see this in neurodegenerative diseases all the time by the time people are diagnosed with alzheimer's disease or als or parkinson's disease uh, already in the case of for example als um, already 50 by the time they go to the doctor because they have they are, have been falling to uh, more or they can they are having hardship buttoning their shirts by then, 50% of their neurons are already dead, motor neurons are already dead, and it's already too late to really try to do something to slow down the disease, if not stop the disease. And because of that adaptive way, what I'm really concerned is that we're receiving also these um, multiple stressors are chronically in our environment right now. We are like, getting ex more exposed to pollutants. We're getting more exposed to heat. We're getting more exposed to chronic stress that comes from, from living in this um, climate crisis and other aspects. And so these are multiple stressors that usually in a lab setting, you can maybe try to control and study one aspect, but we're getting these multiple damages happening for a long period of time, which again is an extremely hard thing to study in a lab environment. Um, and, and so it's, it's we're living our own experiment right now. We don't know what will happen and how these damage will show itself uh, in years from now. In my experience, when I was doing um, my uh, some postdoc studies, I was studying a neurotoxin that may be causing, uh, that was thought to be causing ALS. Uh, and we were trying to, this is an environmental toxin that had been found uh, in algal blooms and so on in lakes. And one of the hardest things for us was, and we knew that this toxin could cause damage and I could show them in cells on a dish. But when I tried to really study this disease on uh, animal models, what we were, it was so hard to be able to distinguish what kind of, how much toxin can we give? How would we expose them? How to really mimic what's happening in real life? And so we don't know how much exposure we're getting digitally, environmentally, chemically um, to our world and how it's affecting. It's almost impossible to really mimic in a lab setting. And so it's very really hard to measure. Well, and that really hits home because my grandfather died of ALS. And I guess, you know, what you're saying is, I mean, the, the body is this incredibly complex system. We still don't know how it all works. 
uh, and I guess all of the correlations in that. So to the extent that we can identify these multiple stressors that you talked about in trying to avoid that point of no return, um, I guess to the extent that we identify them early, that gives us maybe a chance to do two things. One, to stop the practices that are causing the problem and maybe then to develop some sorts of treatments for these problems when they're identified early. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And first of all, I'm sorry to hear about your um, grandfather. Yeah. And yes, those two things are right. I think the science is really moving forward. We're trying to find ways to stop um, stop the disease and, and um, to find markers that would be able to for us to diagnose the disease much earlier before it gets to the uh, state of no return. But we're still um, trying to understand what these risk factors are and, and how we can we can stop them from happening. Um, in the case of Alzheimer's, for example, we do know that there are certain genetic mutations that we know that increases your risk for Alzheimer's, such as if you have these APOE4 genes, uh, two copies of that, one from your mom, one from your dad, um, we know that uh, your risk of uh, having Alzheimer's disease increased by eight to 12 fold. However, the other studies have shown that through some lifestyle factors, um, such as exercising regu regularly, eating a he heart healthy diet, um, having so strong social connections and so on and so forth, you can uh, prevent having the disease by 40 to 50%. Um, so we know that if we can really identify these risk factors that may be causing the disease, we have a higher chance of preventing them and getting them to the stage of no return. And then through, through our other findings of being able to then stop the disease at that early stage and reverse it through what we're doing in the um, scientific and, and clinical studies, then that would that would be able to um, solve this problem, hopefully. Yeah, and that's interesting in the sense that it gives maybe some hope to those suffering from Alzheimer's, either those suffering or their families. Uh, it, it just seems that Alzheimer's, it seems to be on the increase. I, I don't know, I, I just hear a lot more about it lately and uh, you know maybe it's one of those connections to the environment yeah there's definitely um definitely increase and uh, as i said the um studies are predicting that uh, by 2050 um, alzheimer's and dementia uh, will triple in numbers uh, around the world and so yes it is increasing the question is is part is it part, i think it, it's multiple things there could be better diagnosis systems now in hand where we would be seeing normally oh this person is is old so where i come from in turkey usually it was at a certain age when people were older they were like oh yeah you know there they, there was never a title of dementia but you would just assume oh people are forgetting things and and losing their cognitive capabilities and that was kind of given when something that happened longer uh, when they get much older, but now we can diagnose. So part of it is being able to diagnose this disease better and having more awareness of the disease. But part of it is, like you said, is the environmental factors and lifestyle factors that are affecting our communities that are causing an increase in these populations. Interesting. Yeah, I, and we need to do something about this sooner rather than later. Um, it, what was it that sparked your interest in starting EcoNeuro? I understand your son had something to do with this. <laughs> yes, yes, my oldest son. Um, you know, I uh, I'm a neuroscientist, and I've I've been um, my focus has been on studying uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and I was getting more and more interested in the environmental risk factors that are increasing and lifestyle risk factors that are increasing the risk for these diseases. Um, and one day I was walking, um, I had picked up my son from school and we were walking back and he just out of nowhere asked me about climate change. And so I put on my, he he was just uh, five or six year, years older. And then, so I put my scientist hat on and I started explaining him about the warming world and and um, what, what it could mean to our oceans and the environment and the animals. And, and my guy is a big, big animal guy. He loves all the animals. And I could see as I was speaking that um, he got scared and he got teary thinking about all the animals that may be suffering. And so that made me stop uh, on my tracks and kind of put my mom hat back on and be like you know what we this is scared what is happening but we can do something about it and why don't we go home and think about ways we can we can help we can do something we can contribute to this fight against this crisis and uh, so we went home 
and he went to his desk and started drawing um, this kind of um, this island and a Noah's Ark kind of um, ship where he put all his favorite animals, drew all his animals, and he said, okay, I'm going to ship these animals to this island and I'll protect them. And I started thinking, what can I do? You know, um, I'm a neuroscientist, uh, but I know very little about climate change. We, In fact, I had, as a scientist, I had never really thought about climate change before. So I started looking into what do we know about neuroscience and climate change? And I found almost nothing. And I started digging more into it, like, what? Well, how do we know how climate change affects brain health? And that lack of knowledge that I could find in the field made me realize that, you know, this is a crisis we're facing with today. It's not just the future generations, it's affecting our lives today. And uh, so we all have some, anyone can, like, anyone can and should contribute to fighting against this crisis. And perhaps my way would be uh, to really uh, understand, combine my passion for uh, neuroscience and brain health and really dig deeper into see how climate change is affecting that. And that's how, how Econeuro started. Oh, and it's so important to give the next generation that hope and, and to engage them, I think, in the process too. I read that you were actually just made a presentation recently to, or were involved in a class presentation uh, in the school. Just tell us a little bit about that and, and what the kids are uh, talking about and what they're interested in. Sure. Uh, it's it's honestly, as a scientist, one of my favorite things to do is outreach and talk to children about science. There, I I believe children are natural born scientists themselves. They have this innate curiosity and way of questioning, and they not scared to fail they're not scared to ask the wrong questions and it's 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 really such a joy to talk with them about about science and um and recently uh I went to a second grade at my son's classroom he's a second grader now and we talked about um coral reefs and um uh, what an amazing ecosystem they provide in and protecting the oceans and the wildlife uh, oce uh, oceanic wildlife and and we started also talking about how the warming world is affecting uh, these uh, reefs and corals and bleaching them and so on and I have to say first of all the the class knew so much more about coral reefs than I do coral reefs is definitely not my uh, expertise but they were so incredible at the coming up with solutions on what they could do and really giving them that chance to um, speak about solutions and I discussed one way we read a news article so this this was part of an effort I had learned about by Pulitzer Center, it's called um, Local Letters for Global Issues. And um, it runs by Pulitzer Center and it's for elementary, it's a K to 12 grade um, level contest where um, the um, children read about a news article that was funded by Pulitzer Center uh, that about a global issue and they, they discuss it and they come up try to come up with some solutions within their local environment and write letters to their um, local representatives, which I thought really combines such what we try to do at Econoria, but really combines these certain elements that are really important. So we discussed the science of coral reefs, why they are so important. The article we read about was how scientists were finding ways to protect the coral reefs in Florida. So we talked about that. And we talked about how we don't have coral reefs here in California, but there are certain reefs and what we can do uh, to protect them. And next week I'm going back again and we'll be talking about what we can do, how can we get our voices heard, why it's so important to write to our local representatives to try to bring a change. And I think it's a great way for children to really learn that uh, how to be a part of solutions, be part of change to make the world a better place. Um, so it's, it's it's a wonderful experience. I'm so, I feel so grateful for it. Uh, the teachers that allow me to enter their classrooms and to talk to their children because the children are so brilliant and uh, and they're change makers so it's really to tap into that energy is very inspiring and refreshing for me as a scientist as well isn't that amazing and and, and that uh, the local letters for global issues is uh, sounds like a really amazing platform for them to express their concerns and but also that energy that you spoke about i'd love to get the link for that for the uh, show notes for this podcast so uh, I'll, I'll be in touch with you later for that but uh, that that's great to hear about um so i mean going from that kind of positive side to maybe just investigating or talking a little bit more about 
the specific examples of problems that the climate change is ca is causing for the brain. Um, I think you've mentioned a few. You've mentioned heat. Uh, I guess in terms of you know the drought, the heat, and the uh, the vector borne diseases. In terms of your research colleagues, um, can you give us maybe just some specific examples of how those problems manifest and uh, maybe a little bit about what we can do about them right immediately. Sure, absolutely. Um, so one of the ways uh, is the just exposure to extreme heat. And the exposure to extreme heat had been shown to um, cause um, increase of worsening of symptoms, neurological and mental health symptoms. Um, there on in extreme heat events and extreme heat days, there had been increase in um, cases of psychosis and and um, suicide risks as aggression issues, as well as substance uh, increased uh, worsening symptoms for uh, multiple sclerosis, substance uh, abuse disorder, um, and many others we see on these like extreme heat events. So just exposure to extreme heat can really worsen and um, exacerbate uh, the neurological and mental health symptoms. Um, there's also been shown also to reduce productivity and, and for children, long-term uh, attention spans and learning uh, really drops on the days that are, have really extreme heat. Another thing we know is, is air pollution, which also is a um, majorly related to climate change and we see that like I had talked earlier uh, in this episode the exposure to air pollution at the fetal stage and when there was a there's a um, neuroscientist Frederica Pereira she's at Columbia she had studied from the 90s the mothers in Harlem and in New York as well as in Krakow Poland uh, uh, who were who were pregnant uh, with their children and she really studied those mothers who really lived in this highly polluted area areas uh, with air pollution and then they, she studied um, th them for the children for the next 10 years and she had sh shown that kids who are were exposed more had for example low uh, they were born earlier they had low birth weight and then uh, later on they had issues with increased risk for ADHD autism and then the, when they became teens there was higher incidence of anxiety and depression and so they she could really pinpoint to these um damages that are, are these this higher risk for these disorders happening simply from the exposure to air pollution at the very at even before the children were born and we we know also the air pollution also increases risk for dementia we also these uh so also the warming planet causes uh increase in uh, vector borne spread of the vector borne diseases and for the vector borne diseases such as malar malaria and so on to stay longer for longer periods of time and so in certain vector borne diseases such as zika and dengue can have a uh, huge uh, they can cause en en encephalitis and other neurological issues on the on the general population um that's another thing we see that how how climate change affects the brain um another thing is the algal blooms that i have talked about in the lakes that uh, really warming waters um, can cause, these have been shown to produce neuro neurotoxins that have been found that may be linked to increased risk for ALS um, and, and Parkinson's disease. Um, there's a whole mental health aspect, so extreme weather events such as cyclones and tornadoes and wildfires can cause um, increased stress, anxiety, um, depression in people, PTSD in people who experience these events. And there's a whole thing about anxiety among the young people where they feel really nervous and anxious about what their future will look like uh, because of climate change. And um, another thing, the, food, the climate change brings food, increased food insecurity and even uh, immigrations happening because of the uh, food insecurity. Um, so these, these are, and which causes also um, inaccessibility for really brain boosting um, nutrients such as DHA um, and, and also extra stress and anxiety and depression. So there's these are some of the aspects we know already how climate change affects um, brain health. Really affecting really every aspect of our lives. I think that's the, the scary part. 
Is there any particular part of the brain that is particularly susceptible to climate change, or is it the whole system that's affected as far as we know? That's a that's a great question. I don't think we have studied really, you know, these are all more associations. Again, we have not been able to study too much about how something causes the change and where exactly in the brain. Um, this is really hard to pinpoint in a lab setting, but from associations, we see these. And But what I can say mostly from what has been studied, not from, uh, so from what we know, but not general, this might not be the picture of like what really is happening, is we definitely see a lot of cognition and frontal um, cortex like related to decision making and behavior and cognition uh, to be really, really impacted. But these are, again, much easier to be able to measure um, than other aspects such as the motor, but MS can affect the uh, motor cortex and spinal cord. So these we know also get affected. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's an overall, overall effect, uh, but we know that definitely the parts that affect the cognition behavior are um, can be severely um, disrupted. Really interesting. I guess that that's where the brain brings it all together, I guess, is, uh, and that's what gets disrupted, perhaps. Um, you mentioned that we don't really see much discussion about climate uh, change in the brain. Certainly, I mean, that's, that's not, it's been my experience that there hasn't been much discussion about that. Uh, I'm just wondering why you think that is. Is it, is it the measurement problem? Is it a problem with funding? Um, or are there others who are working on it who just, you know, there haven't been any discoveries yet that are worthy of reporting maybe? Is, is it, or is it a combination of all of the above? <laughs> yeah, it's probably a combination of a lot of things. Um, one of the aspects I think is that there are some studies that hint, hint that get to like the, the the like the study I had mentioned about air pollution and the brain development or de dementia risk and air pollution and or extreme heat and so on. But these are all parts of the um, studies that are part that are done by epidemiologists or environmental health experts. Um, when you look at neuroscientists studying climate change, um, I have really not even met a handful of them probably. It's a, for some reason, the field of neuroscience is really, even though we can be very focused on brain health and neurological health or mental health, it's, it's still so focused on genetic models and uh, hereditary um, associations and, and others. And it's really, um, there's very little, I, maybe it's just a, because these fields are all very siloed because we've been thinking so much for years and years, brain as its own kingdom, and that it's like by itself. Um, and but hopefully, uh, I think it's going to start to change. I just want it to be happening sooner than later because I feel like we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. Is there? Do you see signs of funding emerging from governments or universities for this, or is that still in the very early stages? Um, it is very early stages. I don't see much government fund funding around these or much government uh, studies around, uh, focus around this, but there are some foundations. So there's a Kavli Foundation. They recently, it, it's actually a, a colleague and a friend of mine who, who spearheaded this effort. They are st started this whole funding program for changing climate and, and neuroscience. Um, and it's about, but it's really focused more on the basic science on how uh, changing climate could affect um, neuroscience in general, but not very health focused, but there is, but it's a very big step in the right direction. And I think, um, and there, there, she was telling me about that um, there are more talks with other foundations and so on going on. And that's what we're trying to do too, to try to really talk to um, increase the funding support. Um, because when you have funding, researchers will eventually get uh, get interested too uh, yeah. in this yeah. field. Yeah, and, and it's certainly a story that we want to follow as well. It's, uh, and you know, we hope that there's some, helpful or, or hopeful news uh, that will evolve in this as the funds become available. I mean, I guess, you know, the problems that you've described are so big uh, and global uh, that, you know, it, it could take a long time, I guess, to develop comprehensive solutions for these. I'm just wondering in the meantime, you know, what can we do at the local individual or community level? I mean, you've, you've mentioned 
the local letters for global issues example for the children. I think that's great. Uh, is there other issues or other measures that we can take? You know, for example, a community facing a you know a, a heating crisis uh, or outbreak of vector-borne diseases like malaria. What, what can we do, practically speaking, to help to uh, reduce the effects in the near term? Absolutely. I, that's a great question. And, you know, I think um, really focusing on local efforts will be the way to go for it, for bringing solution to this big global problem. Uh, it is a global problem. It is a global, um, I think we have to do our knowledge around global um, cumulative effects, but it's really, if we want to make a change, if we want to act, it has to be at the local level. And, um, you know, the example with, for example, with the air pollution through um, through this professor's um, really efforts on on bringing this research and then talking with the global he- the public health organiz- local organizations in Harlem, she was able to actually make a change and uh, of the school buses turning from uh, fuel fossil fuel uh, burning buses to actually um, green buses, electric buses, and uh, so. Uh, school buses and that was a huge change for for the children um in harlem and really she could see beneficial effects effects of of this effort and so really working on um at the local levels with our communities spreading the awareness spreading information at the local levels on what's happening what would be meaning protecting ourselves and our communities from like you said um from the extreme heat and uh, other uh, weather uh, events and really focusing on our mental health and others mental health to provide support to talk with um and then partnering with uh local ngos and and organ uh, governments um to really make a change and it could be as small as let's change our buses they did that in london they were able to they started in last year 2022 uh going into electrical buses and they saw a huge reduction in carbon emissions uh, because transport is a big part of it and also improvement of the air quality um and so it could be when we're anything that we're trying to do to um reduce carbon emissions and impacts of climate change in general will help will affect our health and brain health as well um and i think at the individual levels uh, to, to be talking about it to be being mindful for our own mental health in our communities and to really partnering with the local organizations will to impact change at the very um local levels will be the way yeah. to do it yeah and i guess what i'm hearing is that there's so many different players at the local level who could be involved in this initiative, whether I guess it's, you know, local health officials or local elected officials, or even just, you know, activists, uh, any of them could help to make a change. I guess one of the things I think that would maybe help inspire people to act is some sort of measurement that really tells us, you know, this is, this is really the effect and you you spoke about the problem of measuring the effects of climate change on brain health. Is that going to be one of the things that you would want to look at in EcoNeuro, or what are the other sort of upcoming things? What what kind of what what's kind of the first thing that we might hope to hear from EcoNeuro that uh, that will be of interest? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and it's a difficult one. We're we're still we're at the very early early stages as of establishing, um, and um, right now the uh, the focus has been really building these partnerships to uh, increase our um, and to be able to do these um, research studies and understanding um, aspects of. Um, negative impact of climate change on brain health, but. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that we would want to work on is to try to see how once we start talking about these and so on, how if one of the things we would like to measure as a way of measuring our impact would be, is this making any changes in the communities that we work with uh, in terms of people, uh, communities awareness, people's awareness, and in terms of whether we can actually also turn it into um, policy changes that is uh, inspired by these talks with the communities. Uh, we do want to have um, 
you know, part of the scientific field, be able to publish uh, perhaps more studies or reviews around like uh, really combining these knowledge we have around the neuroscience and climate change. And that will hopefully, once you have these um, publications and, and uh, articles that will help increase in within the scientific and the clinical uh, com medical communities for uh, like interest and in understanding and funding around this field. Um, and so I think we, we, we will try to uh, work at these two or three peers uh, really, but um, it will be a while before we see a change and that's okay. What I think what matters is, is that the effort is there and one more person we can reach is one more one one closer step we get to the solution so it's okay if it's a slow process um as long as we slowly get at it and, and it would be really encouraging to hear success stories you know specific communities and their success stories once the issue you know comes to everybody's attention what do you think it would take to get the issue onto the world stage like at a cop summit or something like that i, I guess maybe we're nowhere near that at this point or yeah, unfortunately, these 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 um, a lot of media attention will get there. Um, I think, and usually those media attentions do come from, unfortunately, um, from uh, people really understanding how bad how uh, how destructive the damage could be. I really want to get it there before we reach to that point where people are realizing, oh my goodness, the, like we just learned that the air pollution is causing 10 times more Alzheimer's increase in Alzheimer's disease. And then, and the heat is causing 10 times more, blah, blah, blah. And then they realize they make the calculation and they realize that like half of the population will have these diseases by the end of the century or something. I don't want it to be at that point. I'm not saying it will get there, hopefully not, but I'm just saying it, I don't want it to be a big news headline that will get us there. If we can actually just make it a certain concentration area just like we're focusing on the cardiovascular diseases and respiratory diseases let's look at nervous diseases if it could get into that and start building that there i think it will be enough to start from now interesting is to tie it into existing discussions that are already ongoing in related areas i think is what you're saying is that yes yes yeah. and and if we could really show successful um impact oh we did this uh we we had we had this knowledge and we really cut down the heat exposures by bringing these green spaces are forming around schools and we saw this children's performances to increase by twofold like a positive spin-off like that i think could be showing it at a very local level at a you know, local area schools, seeing how it affected the children's well-being, mental health, or uh, co cognitive abilities would be a huge positive boost. And we'd be like, okay, maybe we should really pay attention to this and see how we can scale it globally for other areas as well. Mm -hmm. So it's so important to have champions for these things. And I think, you know, you're you're a great champion for this cause that we really haven't heard about yet. And, and yet, you know, as you say, we we all certainly want to avoid reaching that point of no return. Uh, and I think that's the that's the message that I'm taking away from our discussion today. It's It's been so wonderful, Bertrand, to speak about this. And, and you know, I, we really do want to follow the progress of EcoNeuro and your initiative uh, and your collaborations. It would be really interesting to see how this evolves. And hopefully the discussion will evolve to spread the information more broadly because information is our best defense, I guess, at this point. Absolutely. Thank you, James. This has been a pleasure. And I thank you for providing an avenue to talk about this. Yeah, well, that's great. We we will follow up on this and, and please do stay in touch because we uh, we do want to keep our listeners aware of what's going on. And uh, and if there's anything that we can do to further discussion, I think that's uh, we're, we're doing something good. So thank you for being with us today. It's been great to speak to you. Thanks. Our thanks go to today's guest and to you for listening to the Quantum Feedback Loop. Please subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to check out The Quantum Record at thequantumrecord.com. The Quantum Record is a monthly journal of philosophy, science, technology, and time, where you'll find the latest developments in our rapidly evolving technological world.